Hello. Welcome to our sixth installment uh, of the First Principles series uh, on uh, found in Hebrews chapter 5 through 6. Um, in fact, I'll go ahead and read our opening text. It's getting more exciting as we uh, get closer to the uh, grand finale uh, of this uh, series. Lord willing, uh, will be culminated uh, a week from today, but uh, we'll see how, how it goes. Um, okay, so Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through chapter 6 and verse 2 of Hebrews states, For when, for when, for the time, ye ought to be teachers. Ye have one, need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. That word of righteousness is very important. And we'll factor in uh, in our uh, final uh, teaching. Uh, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us, let us go on unto perfection. That will be our final uh, video teaching, will be on perfection. You know, what is true Christian perfectionism? <laughs> what does it mean? Okay. Um, let us go, go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation. Now, these six videos, this one being the sixth, uh, are foundational teachings in the Christian walk. If these foundations are not in place, uh, like it says in Proverbs, if the foundations be removed, what shall the people do? Okay. So these are foundational teachings and um, <clears throat> of the doctrine of baptisms. Oh, excuse me. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. That's uh, this week's teaching and of faith toward God, and of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Okay, so, now normally these teachings could be taken from uh, in a normal order. I, I kind of started with these again in a backwards fashion, uh, simply because I want to culminate with going on unto perfection. Okay, and then everything he mentions after that is the six foundational truths of Christianity. Okay, but uh, this week we're talking about repentance from dead works. Okay, now there's a lot of scriptures that we're going to cover and go over, so let's dive in to this. The term dead works which in the Greek is nekron ergon, is only found in the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews, uh, which he's of the Pauline school, but it, it is not necessarily, and it is not the Apostle Paul. Uh, but he's the only author uh, in the Bible who uses the term dead works. Okay, um, And he also mentions sin. In the book of Hebrews, you'll find several references to sin. And um, so dead works is not necessarily, not only sin. You know, when I initially uh, encountered this term as a younger believer, I thought of it as, yeah, repentance from dead works. You know, we have to repent of our sin. You know, um, sin is dead works. And that's true. But I limited, the, I limited what uh, the uh, author of Hebrews is implying. He could have simply said uh, evil works. He could simply have said 
<clears throat> sinful works, but he did not. He said dead works. And this is while he uses the term sin in uh, many other places. He mentions trespasses in many other places, in offenses, uh, in, in the book of Hebrews. And so there's something more to this term, necron ergon, that we wish to dive into, okay? Uh, the other place that uh, the author of Hebrews uses the term dead works uh, is found in um, chapter 9 and verse 14. But we'll go there in due course. Dead works, yes, it means sin, but religious works are also included. I hear a holy gasp uh, out in the audience. But uh, when the author of Hebrews uses the term dead works, he not only has sins in mind, but he also has dead works of religion, religious works in mind. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> to understand this, we have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. All the way to the Garden of Eden. Okay. Now, when we discuss the Garden of Eden, we do mean a literal place uh, in the chronological order of history. Okay. Uh, one, one could consider it prehistory. One could consider it, you know, um, bef you know before recorded history for sure. But... Uh, but we can also think of the Garden of Eden in terms of our hearts, okay? Just as when God put Adam in the garden to keep and to dress uh, the garden, so also Proverbs tells us in chapter 4, keep or guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Just as there were four rivers that issued out of the Garden of Eden uh, on the physical plane, or in the natural, so also there are streams of life that flow out of our heart, and we're to keep and dress those gardens, okay? So we can think of this not myopically as something trapped in history, um, but rather as something applicable to our lives now, that you have the Garden of Eden in your heart. There is paradise in your heart, okay, uh, if you know how to find it. Okay, so... As I go back to Genesis chapter 2, gives me a little license to go off course, <laughs> but not too much. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're discussing the issue of <clears throat> dead works as including religious works. Not only sinful works, sinful actions, but also as religious works. Okay, uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9, then we're going to jump down to verses 16 through 17. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, um, now when we think of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, our ears sometimes grow half deaf like, like a, an adder. <laughs> uh, you know, Jesus called the religious hypocrites of his day a brood of vipers. Okay, um, but he, <clears throat> he mentions that uh, the tree, we, don't, we think of it as, okay, you know, we have the tree of life and the tree of evil. You know, we think of the tree of life as good, the tree of evil as bad. No, it says the tree of life. It doesn't make a judgment call as to whether it's good or bad. But then it talks about this other tree that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so this tree is of good and of evil. And verses uh, 16 through 17 say... And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, 
Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay, a couple points here. First, the Bible considers good and evil as a unit. Okay, just as the law is considered a, a unit. You know, the, those who are Torah observant, the Torah observant Jews of their day, counted meticulously how many commands there are in the Torah, the law. And behold, there are 613 commandments in the law, the Torah of Moses. It is considered a unit. If you break one law in the Torah, you have broken them all. You cannot say, well, I keep the Sabbath, but I don't have to uh, follow the dress code of, the, of uh, the Torah. I don't have to observe the new moon of the Torah. I just follow the Sabbaths of the Torah, but I kind of ignore the new moon injunctions. Or I don't eat pork, but I don't really go to church on Saturday. I go to church on Sunday, you know, which is not the Sabbath, and so on. I'm not advocating uh, any kind of Seventh-day Adventist teaching that Saturday is the Sabbath. Uh, I believe that Christ rose on Sunday, the Lord's Day, and historically that's why the first Christians began to uh, meet together on Sunday mornings in honor of the Lord's Day when Christ rose again from the dead. Nevertheless, it is abundantly clear that there's a curse placed on the Torah that if any man break any commandment thereof, he is guilty of the whole law. He is guilty as if he broke the whole law. Maybe one is not a murderer, but if you take up the Torah to observe it, if you take up the law of Moses to follow it, ye ought to be careful because you have entered into a unit. The law is a unit. And if you break one aspect of it, you've broken it all. You may not be a murderer, But if you've broken the Sabbath as a Torah observant Christian, so called, you are guilty of the whole law. The Apostle Paul discusses this in Galatians, and Moses uh, ends the Torah uh, with uh, reference to this fact. Okay. Likewise, we need to think of the flesh as a unit. The flesh is the flesh. The spirit is the spirit. Now, Do humankind in the flesh just go around committing evil all the time? Of course, we could say yes, right? But why hasn't the world been destroyed by now, right? Has not good come of mankind? Has not man done many marvelous things? Built, you know, uh, impressive uh, structures? Have uh, accomplished medical breakthroughs, Uh, you know, cannot someone who is a non-believer, but can they not perform some good work? Can they not be a philanthropist? Uh, Can they not donate tons of money to charities? And I'm not saying that those things are bad. This is not a good or bad judgment call by any means. But here, here what, how the Bible presents the flesh the carnal aspects of man, okay, that from man, from his flesh, which I am here equating symbolically to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, arise both good and evil works, okay? Um, Works that are not evil in and of themselves, but because they arise from the flesh, they are considered dead works, okay? The dead works from which we are to repent of not only include drunkenness and carousing, and lying and, and stealing and things of that nature, but also <clears throat> the good works of religion, you know, uh, the good works of Cain. You know, you have Cain and Abel here again. You have Cain presenting 
the, the hard uh, rot fruits and vegetables of his ground. Fruits come from trees, vegetables from the ground. But he brings these hard rot vegetables as a sacrifice, and yet it's rejected by God. Whereas Abel has trust and faith in the shed blood of the lamb that he sacrifices to God, and God, God accepts Abel's sacrifice. And we all know the result of that story in Genesis chapter 4, how that Cain out of envy kills his brother Abel. So it is today. The religious are envious of those who live by grace, live by faith, and they hate them and they kill them in their heart. They're murderers in their heart. And all too often, murderers uh, in actuality. You know, we see murder arising from religious groups, intolerant groups such as ISIS, the Islamic State in the Levant, you know, so-called. You know, they seek to kill Christians. And what motivates that? Hatred. It's not just a difference of beliefs. You know, but fundamentally, Christianity teaches the gospel of the grace of God, that God set out to save mankind. You know, that salvation is downward from God to man, not upward from man to God, as uh, radical teachings of Islam dictate. As perhaps the, the five pillars of Islam dictate. But that's another sermon. But there are religions, including many Christian religions, that are centered around good works. Even though they have the gospel embedded in their teachings, and they teach from the Bible, they, teach, they have a big cross above their church, but they teach a man-centered, a work-centered, uh, you know, that, that it's man-to-God-word man religion. Uh, <laughs> I read a term uh, recently uh, reading uh, something from Paul Ellis. But he mentioned in this article I read, DIY religion. <laughs> Do-it-yourself religion. You know, and that, that's what it boils down to. You know, man-made religion versus God-revealed religion, or God re re God's revelation versus man's religion. Man's religion is DIY. Do-it-yourself. All too often. And all too often, the name Christian is slapped right over it, too. So, let me go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 on this point. Because in Genesis, before I leave Genesis chapter 2, when God uh, warns Adam about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he says, For in the day that ye shall eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now most translations do that verse a disservice, because what the Hebrew actually says is, that dying ye shall die. For in the day that ye shall eat thereof, dying ye shall die. So man's life, you know, he's dead, but he's also dying at the same time. You know, in the day that you shall eat thereof, okay? So th there's an instantaneous death that occurs, and it's a separation. But the separation is not from God. You know, <laughs> this is going to blow some, someone's mind. But we are not dead toward God in the sense that God considers us, you know, as far as God's concerned, this, this death is in the mind of man. This deadness is in the mind of man. You know, because man has alienated himself from God, though God still loves man, God still sees himself in union with man, but man has <clears throat> buried himself in his own death, in his own carnal thinking, and has alienated himself in his mind. You know, uh, we are enemies in our mind through wicked works, Ephesians says. But in dying ye shall die. So there's a, an instantaneous spiritual death that occurs, at least you know, in, as far as the mind of man is concerned, because he's alienated himself from the life of God, uh, hardening his heart. 
in dying ye shall die. So there's this dying that uh, that begins to occur, this outworking of death and uh, affecting, of course, the physical body. And, uh, <clears throat> and Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 states, And you hath he quickened, or made alive, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Okay, so this clearly teaches, and there's other verses uh, that teach. But here it says plainly in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, that ye were dead in trespasses and in sins. Uh, and Paul writes in uh, 1 Timothy uh, about uh, a woman who lives a wanton life, uh, you know, upon becoming a widow, um, says that she is dead while she lives. So even though physically one is running around, you know, animated, <laughs> biologically alive, nonetheless, there's a death nature, there's a death principle at work. You know, she is dead while she lives, okay? So it's from this standpoint that we consider the flesh. And so whatever this flesh can produce is dead. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil bears forth the fruits of both good and evil. Yes, evil we all know. The law of God is written in our hearts. We all know what's right. We all know what's wrong. Okay. Um, we may have buried our conscience. We may have deadened our conscience. Uh, we've become deadened to, alienated from our conscience. But deep down inside, we, we know what's right and what's wrong. You know, and the Holy Spirit, you know, reminds us <laughs> when, when the Holy Spirit's dealing with us, bringing us into that place of repentance, which we're going to touch on here. Uh, you know, our, our conscience may become acute, acutely sensitive <laughs> at that point. I know... That was uh, the story for me when I was uh, uh, 18, 17 and 18. Uh, my conscience was acutely sensitive as he was bringing me out of my trespasses and sins, <laughs> you know. Um, but we want to consider now dead works versus good works, you know, because we touch on... Um, Religious works as being as dead as sinful works. Considering the source, you know, you are dead in trespasses and in sins. How can anything good come of you, right? Um, even though there is good, there is apparent good that occurs in this world. And thank God for it. I think God in his wisdom set it up that way. There is apparent good that comes out in this world. People have at least... If their ultimate intentions are selfish, at least they have s several proximate intentions that are uh, more or less good, <laughs> maybe even very good. Um, and so, <laughs> um, but doesn't the Bible, I mean, if, if our religious works are dead works, doesn't the Bible enjoin us to commit good works? Will we not be judged according to our works? So on and so forth. Now, please, at this point, um, you can write down a uh, note for yourself to refer to the video teaching I do um, in this series earlier on, uh, on judgment, okay? Um, and, and I discuss works uh, in relation to that there, so. Dead works versus good works, okay? Okay. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. <clears throat> Jesus said during the Sermon on the Mount, He said, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So the Bible, of course, is not averse to good works. You know, the Christian, uh, as you'll see in that other video, will be judged according to their works, you know, uh, when they face the Bema seat of Christ, okay? Um, so he says, let your, you know, he wants that men should see 
our good works before our Father. And just in case anyone out there is wondering uh, what this uh, mark on my head is, I, I, I literally bumped my head on, the, on a door last, last week, uh, last uh, Tuesday. Um, I was heading out the door for something. I turned around and bam, <laughs> uh, good night. So um, I was not drunk, <laughs> as you suppose. But yeah, it, it left quite a dinger right there. But it's healing nicely, so thank you for your concern. <laughs> okay, all right. So, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10, gives us the, it juxtaposes works in general versus the good works that, that the Lord would would uh, accept, that would be acceptable before the Lord for us. Ephesians chapter 2, again, right? We were just in Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> okay, right before Galatians, after 2 Corinthians. Oh, after Galatians, I'm sorry. After Galatians. Okay. This is such an important text. Um, I find myself referring to it very often. Um, so important. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. Like Jesus said about the Pharisees, for their works they do for to be seen of men, but they have their reward. That's what dead works is right there. You know, um, aside from getting drunk, aside from, you know, uh, sexual immorality, uh, hating people, lying to people, uh, things of that nature. Besides the obvious evil works that are done, good works in the sense of supposing that, that we are saved by our works. That's a dead work. Um, and so it says, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we have any works that we suppose we can boast in, well, I give money to charity. I go to church every Sunday. Who are you to condemn me? You know, those are dead works. If you boast in what you do, spiritually or religiously, behold, necron ergon, dead work, right there. Verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So there's good works right there. We have not saved by works, lest any man should boast, but we are created unto good works. Okay, So we are already saved by God's grace through faith, not of ourselves, <clears throat> but we are we are created unto good works, which God hath before ordained. So there's this whole slew of good works that have been preordained for you to uh, fulfill. And that's, that's part of the fun of <laughs> finding the will of God in our lives and seeking his divine destiny as we live for him, you know, discovering uh, these good works. It's kind of like an Easter egg hunt. You know, uh, you know, we're in the shadow of Easter on the other side of Easter here. <laughs> you know, you have send out a bunch of children to go look for Easter eggs. Well, that's kind of like a Christian. You know, we're already loved children of God. But God has set these good works out there for us. And, uh, you know, you know, like a kid, you know, you kind of feel sorry for them. They can't find an Easter egg. They're all crying. I can't find any eggs. You know, and you're, you're kind of like directing them. You're saying, uh, might be near that uh, green, that big oak tree over there. Uh, look toward the uh, trunk of the tree there, you know, and, and uh, you kind of give them little hints. That's kind of like God, you know, he gives us little hints about uh, divine destiny and, and we go and we find 
those preordained good works that he's uh, set aside for us. So, and let's go to John chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 28 through 29. This whole uh, text is very interesting because it's, you know, like, all, all, the, all the Gospels, you know, the Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all record the feeding of the 5,000 um, miraculously through the five loaves and two fishes. And John also records that event. But he goes a little deeper. He kind of tells you the aftermath. He kind of uh, opens the curtain to what happened afterwards. You know, when the crowds were dismissed, or actually when the crowds started following Jesus around, trying to make him a king, uh, so on and so forth. But uh, during this, these interactions that these multitude have with Jesus, uh, which had turned out that several of his disciples ended up leaving him because of the uh, truths that he presented later on in the chapter. But... Chapter 6, verses 28 through 29 state, Then said they unto him, What shall we do <laughs> that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Okay, so they're like, okay, they were trying to get Jesus to perform another miracle so they could eat again, okay, earlier in the chapter. So then it comes around, and they're like, okay, well, what, what can we do so that we might work the works of God? Excuse me. <laughs> Not enough coffee yet. <clears throat> if you're not going to feed us miraculously, how can we feed ourselves? <laughs> and, and in a sense... On the surface, yeah, okay, they're they're hungry. They're they're uh, maybe they're hungry for entertainment too. They just want to see another miracle, you know. Uh, razzle dazzle us again, you know, magician. <laughs> um, but deeper here, we see DIY religion again because you know what might we do to work the works of God, you know? What shall we do? That is the essence of DIY religion, DIY Christianity. What might we do? What do, what do I need to do to be saved? You know, what is the bare minimum requirement or what great thing, as the rich young ruler asked Jesus, what great thing must, can I do to be saved, <laughs> right? He wanted to boast in his works. Um, but Jesus' answer to this multitude was, um, <clears throat> this is the work of God, that she believe on him whom he hath sent. Christ is revealed, there's divine revelation, believe on him and you'll be saved. You know, Believe on him whom he has sent, which is Jesus. Put your trust and faith in Jesus and in what Jesus did for you. Jesus believed for you. His faith saves you. Uh, his grace saves you. Uh, you know, he is, he becomes your salvation and so on and so forth. He becomes your righteousness. Trust in that. Believe on that. And you have done the work of God. Okay. <clears throat> now we want to discuss um, dead works and repentance. Okay. Now, the author of Hebrews starts this out by saying, um, not laying again the foundations, you know, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You could see on one hand, too, that uh, repentance from dead works and faith toward God go hand in hand, okay? But he says, not laying again the foundation. So this whole First Principles series is about six foundational teachings that need to be in place that we ought to have a firm grasp of before we can go on to the meat of God's Word. You know, there are those who basically, 
they try to feed steak to a baby. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you had your children, you did not set them up in the high chair and cook uh, filet mignon for them, or you did not cook prime rib for them. You did not cook, you know, some uh, complex food for them. You couldn't even give, I couldn't even give my, my daughter honey till she was three years of age. <laughs> So, because it was too complex for her, her body to digest, okay? And so it is. Some people give these deep spiritual teachings, not caring about uh, the, the age levels, the, the, the levels of spiritual maturity represented in their congregation, and they cause some to stumble. They could cause some to stumble, some to, to choke on those truths, okay? But <clears throat> he says, you know, meat is for those who, by who those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. Okay, uh, we'll get into that, uh, Lord willing, next week. But you have to be spiritually have spiritual capacity to take on certain truths. Jesus said to his disciples, "There are many things yet that I have to to share with you, but you cannot bear them now." Howbeit, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Thank the Lord for that. So God knows how much we can handle at any given time. And the skillful teacher, uh, like it says in Song of Solomon, under your lips is honey and milk. Okay, Because a skillful teacher will know how to speak both nourishing and nurturing truths to babes in Christ as well as more meatier uh, s topics and subjects to those who are more mature in the faith. And in fact, in one sentence, if someone speaks from the spirit, not from the they're not teaching out of their carnal, egoic self, but they're teaching from the spirit. They could say one sentence, and a mature believer will be fed deeper truths. He'll see deeper truths in that. And a babe in Christ will be nourished and nurtured on that as well because it will be milk to, to that one. So, why we went... Okay, because we're discussing foundational, that these first principles are foundational truths. And repentance from dead works is that. Uh, repentance from dead works. We know that <clears throat> Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17... And this was true of John the Baptist also. But the first words, you know, after Jesus, uh, you know, was, was led into the wilderness, you know, he was baptized in water. Uh, he was led by the Spirit, driven by the Spirit into the, into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And, and when he was ready and he, he was done with all of that, and when he began to teach, you know, this was his first sermon, right? So in John chap or Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now the word repentance is more often misunderstood. Uh, especially in uh, Ar Arminian Christianity, where so much emphasis is on the human will. You, may, you need to make a decision for Christ. You know, when were you born again? When did you become a Christian? When did you decide to follow Christ? So on and so forth. Um, you know, or someone's struggling and, and more is demanded of them. You know, like, dude, I'm, I'm failing here. I need prayer. I need help. They're like, well, you need to you need to get in the Word more. You need to get into prayer more. You need to fast more. You know, you, 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 dead works again, okay? But <clears throat> that is not what repentance means. Repentance in the Greek is metanoia, which means a change of mind, okay? You need a fundamental change of mind. Now, that will often look like repentance as we would classically see it, uh, you know, as a change of direction, a change of heart, uh, you know, f uh, you know, you're going one one direction. Now you're doing a 180, and you're going the other direction. That's all included. 
But there's something deeper that happens, you know, metanoia. There's something in the essence of the mind, of, of the soul of man, uh, his intellectual uh, sta status, his intellectual states change. There's a change of will. Repentance is a phenomenon of the will, but it is not something that is brought about by the will, if that makes sense. You know, the Bible uh, presents repentance as a gift from God. And the Bible says that um, repentance comes about because of the goodness of God. Um, <clears throat> and so these things are given to us and, and it's given to us when we realize just how good God is. When we realize the goodness of God, you know, because we used to wave um, Bibles over people's heads and, and threaten them with the wrath of God, with divine wrath. You know, that if you didn't make this decision, you were go going to be punished for eternity. You know, you were going to go to hell, okay, is how we would word it. And, <clears throat> but that's not what brings about true repentance. You know, a true change of mind, a true change of heart, uh, metanoia comes about when grace, divine grace is revealed to us. And we realize just how good God is. You know, God loves you. God forgave you already. God has prepared a kingdom for you already. God has forgiven all the sins that you've ever committed and all that you would could ever commit in the future. God sovereignly decided to forgive you. And instead of giving someone license as as our natural man might think, it actually causes something to be birthed in our heart. Well, wow, the just for the unjust. You know, he became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so repentance from dead works is something of the mind and of the heart that <clears throat> we realize that, you know, not only are, is our evil works not pleasing to God, but even our good works that we think we're doing to please God, that we think we have to appease God, we think we have to earn our way into heaven, uh, when we repent from those dead works of religion, that is also um, a matter of repentance. That is also a matter of metanoia. We approach God differently now. We no longer approach him as an angry taskmaster waiting to club us over the head the next time we fail. Instead, when we realize the goodness of God, it, what's birthed in our hearts is a true repentance, a metanoia, where we realize that uh, wow, God is that good. <laughs> you know, I need to quit trying to please him in myself. I can, I can relax a little. You know, it's no longer this iffy, dicey relationship with God where, you know, he's happy with me today. He's angry with me tomorrow. Today I might be saved, but I might be unsaved tomorrow. You know, I might be under grace today, but under wrath tomorrow, <laughs> you know, so on and so forth. You know, so th we need to repent and, and that repentance comes through grace, realizing the goodness of God. And <clears throat> we, it causes us to change our mind about dead works, the dead works of religion. Dead works versus serving the living God. <clears throat> you know, we saw here repentance from dead works. But the other reference to dead works that the author of Hebrews uses in, is in chapter uh, 9, in verse 14 of Hebrews. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God, without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. <laughs> you know, we often talk about, you know, sin is included in this. Again, you know, dead works is sin, which was my original interpretation of that term. But also included in dead works is the good works of religion. The dead works of religion. The works of Cain. <laughs> Cain wasn't uh, committing uh, a known sin, you know, um, 
in his offering to God. But what he was offering was his pride, his pridefulness. I mean, not that he was laying it on the altar, but he was taking up pride in what he was doing religiously as if it was going to cause God to owe him something. You know, that's the sin of Cain. But, but it wasn't something overtly sinful. It was something rather the sin of the heart, the sin of pride, okay, that Cain was uh, committing. And uh, so dead works includes, the, you know, dead works of religion, you know. Um, but this being juxtaposed with serving the living God. Okay, you know, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Remember those good works we discussed uh, as found in Ephesians chapter 2? That God hath prepared for us good works, you know. <clears throat> he foreordained these good works. He created us for these good works. You know, He already saved us. He already uh, forgave us he through his grace by faith we tapped into that by faith his faith as well um, we realize you know that we are already saved by his grace his sovereign God's sovereign act of grace to save us apart from works and yet it is unto these foreordained good works that he has for us okay this is what uh, is being discussed here in Hebrews chapter 9. It's just a beautiful parallel uh, with Ephesians 2 because it says we repent from dead works. It says we're purged by the blood of Jesus from dead works to serve the living God. You know, once you get the dead works of religion out of the way, you can discover what good works really mean, you know, and what good works are for and the proper place of good works. You know, we perform good works not because we're trying to be saved or trying to be accepted by God, uh, but because we are accepted by God, because we are already forgiven by God. So these good works spring from that place of, of um, salvation through grace, you know. <clears throat> so Luke chapter 24 and verse 15, when um, Jesus rose from the dead, okay, and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, uh, and other women went to go uh, anoint the body of Jesus, you know, as it was buried in that sepulcher. You know, instead they encountered two angels in shining white garments, and they asked them and said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? <clears throat> 